Oh, you guys, it's great having you full house in, the, in here this morning, and I'm just excited to share the word with you guys this morning. And so um, I, before I even get into the word, and, and by the way, my name is Jeff Young. If we haven't met, I'd love to meet you, and uh, my wife and I have the privilege and honor of leading Life Church together, and, and it's just always, I say it every morning, but I, I mean it, it's just a joy. It, we really love it and love you guys and love um, doing what the Lord's asked us to do. And it uh, doesn't mean it's easy, but it means exactly where we're supposed to be. And I hope you find yourself in that same spot. Um, <clears throat> but welcome to our second of three services. This is the third week we've been doing this. And for those of you who are new, you're like, well, I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. I mean, I'm just coming, which is great. I'm glad you're here. But for those who have been around for a while, you're like, man, this is, there's a, th- this is a stretching. You know, there's a, there's a place where it's, it's growing and, and we're, we're leaning into that. And, and I want to just remind us, I want to continually keep this in front of us, that this is, this is a point for us that it, it has nothing to do with numbers. It has nothing to do with growing bigger and becoming this behemoth-sized church. It, it has everything to do with connecting people to Jesus. Can I hear an amen from somebody? <laughs> right? This isn't, you're not coming to be served. You're, you're coming to be on mission. You're coming with, with this understanding that, man, God is up to something, and together with the body of Christ, as we, as we link arms together, that, that there's, man, there's going to be momentum and power and authority in what he wants to do, and, and I want to rally us to that. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> So I I want to continue to put this in front of us. So we're at three services. That's fantastic. I love that. It's great. Uh, The the thing about it is when that fills up, we're not going to four. (laughs) Hey, somebody else. I knew that was coming. (laughs) Woo! I mean, three is a lot. And here's here's what I believe, that Jesus already died for the church. We do not have to. In our weakness, he's made strong. So we're in our, I want to lean into limitations. Actually, limitations are fantastic because that's when we lean in on the Lord. And so when we lean in our limitations, we understand, man, Lord, you've got to do something, not me. And I love it because there's no, there's, in essence, there's no pressure. And so when we reach the capacity that we need to get to with three services, then we're going to launch out a campus. And I would love, love, love for you to be praying, period. Just be a prayerful people, would you? But most of all, with this in mind, would you be praying for Life Church and praying, am I supposed to be part of that campus? Am I supposed to be part of this, this, this extended mission that the Lord has for us? What, 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 do, what Lord, are you doing in my life? And, and if not, then what is my role here at this, at this church? Because, man, the Lord, what I love is what's going to happen is we're going to send, uh, my, my goal is 100 to 150 people to a new church and we're all going to be one church, it's going to be great. But then, that, that means we're going to have quite a few holes. Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. I'm looking at you right there, right, right there, and right there, and right there. That you, the Lord has made you and gifted you to, to be a person that says, Lord, what do you want to do with me? How can I serve your body? How can I serve your church? And it is an honor and a privilege to do so. And so I just want to continually keep that in front of us. And just be praying. Uh, I don't know when that's going to happen. The Lord hasn't given me a date yet, but I imagine that it's not too far away. And I, that makes me very excited to see the Lord use more and more people for the kingdom of God here in, in Chico and Butte County. Uh, we're doing this series called Let's Talk About Jesus. And uh, I thought that's probably a good thing to do in church, to talk about Jesus. Anybody with me? Um, we, we shared a couple of weeks ago on highlighting the harvest. That was our last sermon series. And it just kind of led right into this series called Let's Talk About Jesus. And, and my heart and my, my mind right now, it's like, hey, if the harvest is here, if the harvest is plentiful, if you drive around uh, Chico, Butte County, California, you will see that the harvest is plentiful. The hurting and the hopeless are, are innumerable right now, and we have the opportunity with Christ within us to make a difference in somebody's life, and so, and, and hopefully an eternal one, and so my, my heart was, man, Lord, we want to be a people that, that talk about you, that, that just are, have, live this life with you as part of it, not, not that I would leave you at home as I go to work and I do my job and then I come home and, and then I put you back on. No, it would be that I carry the spirit of the living God within me everywhere I go. 
And when I live this life out that the Bible calls me to live, then, then I walk this Christian life out with compassion and eyes to see like Jesus does and to respond the way he does. And then, guess what? <clears throat> I use my voice. Because he didn't just give us action, he gave us words. He gave us life to speak. And at some point in your walk, in your faith, you're going to come to that line where you decide, am I going to be a person of faith that shares my faith or somebody who just lives this privately? And man, I'm, I'm just encouraging you to be a person that just continually steps out one step after another in faith and watch and see how the Lord uses you in who he's made you to be. And you thrive in that instead of, well, how, how would, how would um, Pastor Jeff do this? How would... How would Pastor Chris or Carissa, how would how would we how would they do it? No. How has God made you to do it? Because you're the very person that the Lord has put in people's lives, not me. And so I want to encourage you with that. And and I want to be a people that that talk about the Lord, that that it makes it makes it normal. Every part of our conversation would just share, like, hey, this is what I'm reading in scripture. This is where I'm challenged. This is where I'm wrestling with the Lord. This is, man, this is what God did this week. Can you believe it? I'm just like so excited, you know? Whatever it might be, that we would begin to just have this as a normal part of our walk and our, and our conversation with the Lord. And so um, just a little recap of let's talk about Jesus. Week, week one was just all about Jesus' humanity. We looked at a lot of uh, scripture outside the gospel that confirms that Jesus took on flesh that he had to, to die a human death in order to live for eternity. And and so we talked about that. I want to encourage you to go back and listen to those if you didn't, didn't hit them uh, or, or weren't here. Uh, the second week, last week, was that Jesus is relatable and in, in a really incredible way where John the Baptist, we looked at this last week, where John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus saying, hey, are you really the, are you really the one who is to come or, or, or should we be expecting somebody else? And I, I just read so much doubt in there. And, and we got to see Jesus' humanity respond to his, his friend, in fact, his relative, John, who is in jail and totally encouraged him and, and had incredibly uh, a deep, profound sense of compassion for him in the midst of uh, what he had to face in the coming days for John the Baptist. And then this morning, I want to talk about uh, how Jesus was tempted in every way. And so Jesus was tempted in every way. And so as we share these sermons, as we share these stories, what I'd love for you to do is, how do you, how do you communicate Jesus' relatability? Because if he's human, he relates with us from a human standpoint, flesh on flesh, right? Like he understands the things that we all go through. He understands a headache, you know? He understands when he stubs his toe. He understands when he, when he gets a paper cut or whatever it might be. He gets all of that stuff and, and he gets the emotional side of things as well. So Jesus is very relatable and he's someone that we can talk to our friends about in a relatable way, not in like this, God is in heaven, you know, like, and we have to have this deep theology about all these things. No, we can just be relatable, dare I say, like, normal and not weird. Don't be a weird Christian. It's so off-putting. It, it is. Be who God made you to be, but have confidence in who he is in you and watch what he does so let's be talk, people that talk about jesus romans ten fourteen says this how then can they call on the one they have not believed in how can they believe in the one whom of whom they have not heard how can they hear without someone preaching to them friends that's our voice at some point, we will have the opportunity, if we are prayerful, if we're diligent, if we're aware, if we are pressing in, we will have the ability at some point to speak out what Jesus has done in your life. And I want to encourage you, make him relatable in the ways that he is to you. But Jesus is relatable. Listen to, like, I'm going to continually list these attributes of Jesus every single week, but man, he's loving. And that's what I'm always going to start with. He was loving, kind, thoughtful, on mission. He was one who invites in. Every time you see Jesus inviting in, um, he, was, uh, he sees people. He sees you, but also he sees the person you're connecting with. You, you understand? Like, when I'm connecting with somebody, I have to have this in mind that Jesus sees this person. 
He sees their depths, he sees their sorrows, he sees their highs, he sees their lows, and he knows exactly how to bless them, and it might just happen to be through me. This vessel that he gets to use to to be a voice uh, of the Lord. But he responds, he's thoughtful, he's patient, and goodness, he is so humble. He's quite the example so Jesus lived this perfect life. That's why we want to be like Christ who is sinless. And, and so we, we take this uh, to heart. Hebrews 4.15 says this, and, and we've been sharing this verse every week, and I will continue to do so. But it says this, For we do not have a high priest, they're talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. Tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. This is why we get to look to Jesus for help in the time of need. Tempted in every way, but he did not sin. Can you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4? Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to read this, this story where Jesus is tempted in the desert. But before uh, I read it, I want to share about a couple things. Uh, when you respond to God's calling, when you respond to God's calling on your life, don't be surprised how quickly the wilderness might come. Don't be surprised when hardship comes knocking at the door as soon as you go, Lord, I'm all in! And then wham! Whoa, what was that? No, I'm supposed to have an easy life now. (laughs) And everybody who's been a believer for more than six seconds goes, yeah, no, that's not the case. Don't be surprised when hardship comes when you say yes. Yes. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. God opened the heavens and the earth, and as as John was lifting Jesus out of the water, the heavens broke open, the dove, the Spirit of God, it says, fell on Jesus, came down on Jesus, and, and God's voice came booming out. I believe everybody heard this. I think it was an audible voice that said, this is my son. Okay, everybody say that with me. This is my son. Okay, this is my son. And then, he, and then he goes on, who I love, in whom I am well pleased. But Jesus hadn't done anything yet. How, how is that? But God, you can't say that yet. He didn't take the cross yet. He didn't do all the things he was supposed to do yet, and yet he's still pleased with his son. And he loves him. Interesting. Could you imagine being there, heavens breaking open? This is my son. It was a commissioning moment. And I think it was a moment, I, I don't think Jesus talks about this moment in scripture, you don't see it, but I imagine he carried that moment with him everywhere he went. My father, I'm I'm. And he loves me. Oh, he loves me. And he is so pleased with me. So when he's confronting the Pharisees, oh, this is so hard. But I know that I am loved. Oh, I know my my father is so pleased with me. When he's going and walking through and he's getting ridiculed and when he's getting a crown of thorns shoved and beaten onto his head, oh my God, my father, he loves me. Man, that is the Jesus that we follow. But I imagine he kept this in him, like just in, in, I don't know, just in his soul, I can feel that Jesus would do that and as he walked through all of the different temptations and trials and all the things. And I just think of the voice of God coming and affirming Jesus and how he's given us voice to affirm one another. Like, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Like, we have the power to encourage and affirm and equip and love and care for one another but also those who are not within the body of Christ. And what that will do for people, it will buoy them, it will strengthen them when you just say, goodness, I'm so grateful for you. 
Thank you for being just a man of God or a woman of God. Thank you for leading the way. Thank you for being faithful day in and day out. That, that's amazing. But that you would encourage and equip one another just like that so that when we hit trials, we go, I'm loved. I remember that one person who I don't even know 17 years ago, they, they shared that with me and, and, it, and it buoys me. Parents, from a father to a son, I am well pleased. I love you. To say that to your children day in and day out is one of the most, if not the most powerful thing you can do. That you would offer the love of Christ with your kids. That you would affirm that who they are instead of allowing the world to teach them who they are not. Come on. That when my kids go through trial, they'll hear my voice and not the world's voice. They'll hear my voice, which comes from the Lord, that says, this is who you are. I love you. I am so proud of you. That when they go through college or when they go through hardship in marriage, whenever they have kids of their own, that they would look back and go, man, I know my mom and my dad. They love me and I messed up, but man, they're still with me. They're still beside me. That, come on. That's not even in my notes. <laughs> but this is what our kids need. And guess what? If you're an adult, you can do that for other kids too, you know. That you, man. I had an opportunity this week just to wrap my arm around one kid who was just struggling. I said, hey, you're loved. I see you. You're loved. I know your year is rough. But you are loved. And he actually looked at me. Pretty good for a seventh grade boy. <laughs> but we can do that. And it's powerful. So here we are. As we're about to read this story, Jesus is being led into the wilderness. And I want to remind you, think about the Israelites. They were, they got to flee e Egypt. The waters parted. They went through the water. And then they experienced 40 years in the desert. Freedom. Salvation. Desert. Jesus gets baptized through the water 40 days, 40 nights of fasting and prayer. So here we are, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. <laughs> Shocking, I know. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, everybody say, If. Tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, Is it written? It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city. And he had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he said this, If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Then Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse nine, uh, 8, sorry. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan. That's an exclamation mark in my Bible, so I'm allowed to yell a little bit. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. So Jesus was led by the Spirit. He was led to the, by the Spirit into the desert, which is its own sermon in and of itself. But this is what I want to point out. Jesus was led. That shows incredible humility. The best leaders are the best followers. Can I get an amen? Any boss will tell you that. 
If you, if you learn how to follow and humble yourself, oh my goodness, you will lead well. But this is Jesus. He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And the tempter, it says, the tempter who is the devil, and just, just so we're clear in the house of God, the devil is real. He's not allegory. He's not metaphorical. He is not just this comic, like, caricature of a, of, a, of a devil, you know, red with horns and, and fire coming out of his mouth. This is, that's not the devil. The devil is real. He's, a, he's an adversary. He's the father of all lies. And he is trying desperately to distract us away from the king of kings. All right, so, so this is the real deal. This is not just some made up like thing. This is, this is Jesus face to face with the devil. And Jesus, it says that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry. <laughs> Shocking, I know. So he's starving, right? Like, after anybody goes through 40 days, I mean, we can't even miss a meal, can I? Come on. Like, if you miss a meal, you're like, oh, I'm so hungry, my blood sugar, glucose, I need something. Like, I need to, oh, I'm going to pass out, you know? Like, Jesus did this for 40 days. So he's depleted, emotionally, spiritually physically depleted. And when does the enemy come? At the 40 days. Interesting. He didn't come on day one. Because, you know, day one of a fast, you're like, yeah, I'm going to tackle this. It's going to be great. Day two, you're like, oh, gosh. Oh, don't, no temptation right now. No, 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 no. You know, day three, oh. Day 40. That's when he's the weakest. This is when Jesus' humanity is prime time for failure. This is where we connect with Jesus on a relatable level where I say, you know what, I am tempted when I am, when I am tired, when I'm stressed out, when I'm overworked, when I'm overburdened, when I have too many uh, pans in the, uh, f- irons in the fire, whatever, you know, you know what I'm talking about. When I've got too much going on in life, this is where the enemy wreaks havoc. And this is where Jesus is being tempted the most. And, and so the enemy comes in, and, and, and he's trying to get to him. But this is, this is what I want to share with you. You know, in your weakness, in your times of trial, in your times of temptation, um, it's usually when you're very depleted. When you're, on, when you're on your, like, spiritual high, like, it's pretty rare that anything's going to take you out of that moment. But you, you know, you, you guys have been to camp. You're up on that mountain. You have this moment with Jesus and the other believers, and it is just like, yeah. And then you come back down. Day one's fantastic. Day two is pure hell. <laughs> you're like, what the heck just happened? Why did Jesus fast? Some of you might ask that question. Fasting is an, is an incredible time of preparation. It's a time of connection with the Lord. It's a time where you say, Lord, I need you to speak into this matter. It's a time where I I dedicate my spirit over my flesh, where I starve the flesh to feed the soul, is what some some cool preachers say. That I I really have this uh, time of focus on something specific and Jesus' mission in front of him, he definitely knew what was in front of him and he wanted to be with the Father, I think. And he needed to be. So Jesus was tempted in every way and here's the enemy coming after him. In his weakest time, probably of his life at this point, is my estimation. First temptation, the enemy says, hey, why don't you, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Why don't, why don't you just do a miracle and, and eat? You know, it's been 40 days. Like, come on, I'm, I'm sure you're hungry. Let's go. Why don't you just let, show me what you got? You, you deserve to eat. I mean, come on. You deserve dessert. You deserve that letdown because it's been such a hard week. You, get, you have the right to just kind of like kick back and drink a few too many drinks. You deserve it. It was our week. Come on. And then he says, but he, he starts this, and he actually starts it with the doubt that he, that he brought to Adam and Eve. If you are the son of God. Isn't it interesting that God the Father just proclaimed that over his son 40 days before this? 
This is my son. If you are really the son of God, just turn those into turn those stones into bread. Come on, show me what you got. I know in our flesh, in my flesh at least, I'd be like, yeah, I'll show you what I got. Wham! Like, and, and then all of a sudden I'd have this bakery and he'd eat all this fresh bread right in his face and be like, yeah, take that, devil. And then I'd be like, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. And then I'd have to go repent. It'd be this whole process. Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone. He quotes out of Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you would understand this. In Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8, it's, it's really Moses telling the story of the Israelites. And, and this is the moment in time where the Israelites were in the desert being fed by manna on a daily basis. So, so it was really incredible that Jesus pointed to this place in Israelite history where they actually failed. And he said, I'm going to take this over. I'm going to redeem the situation. So I'm going to take this failure. But, but by the way, the Israelites had to, had, to, had to rely on the Father to give them manna every day. It, it wasn't this like thing where they said, hey, Lord, will you give us manna? And, and then they had enough to sustain themselves for a week or a month. It was, it was a single day. They, they would go out. If people tried to take more, it would get moldy and gross in their tent overnight. So the Lord was trying to teach them, get your daily bread by me, with me, on a daily basis. At some point, I'm going to do a sermon series called The Boring Life of Christianity. Like, just live a life dedicated to the Lord, faithful, day in, day out. Maybe not too many highs, maybe not too many lows, but just faithful. Lord, give me your bread for the day that I might eat whatever that you have for me today that I might just rely on you today and that tomorrow I know I can come do the same again and again and again. Jesus' mission was not his stomach, so he was able to say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I don't need to do that. I don't need to prove to you that I'm the son of man. I am the son of man. So he basically said, no, not going to happen. Second temptation is this, where, where Satan took him up to the, big, the, the, the highest point of Jerusalem on the temple and said, throw yourself down. And by the way, since you quote, quoted scripture to me, I'm going to quote scripture to you. So Satan uses Psalm 91, 1, or 91 and shares the scripture with Jesus. Saying, if you, if you leap, the angels will catch you and, and you won't even strike your foot on the ground. How deceiving is that? That the devil, the enemy, would use scripture to combat Jesus or to, help, or to, to try to tempt him to fail. Wild. And by the way, he starts off the same way saying, if you are the son of man. Friends, I just talked about doubt last week, but the enemy is the king of doubt. And if you continually have these doubts coming in, you might want to stand up and say, Jesus, remove the doubt. Dispel the lies. Firm up my faith that I might not doubt in you. But Satan uses the scripture and and he uses it fairly convincingly. The only problem is he's using it against Jesus who knows all the scripture. And he goes, dude, you're taking that way out of context, bro. Like, it's not even close. I don't have to test my father. I trust my father. Come on. I don't have to test God. I trust God. I don't have to throw this thing out and say, well, Lord, if you do this, then then I'll know. No, I stand in trust. That, That is a combination of trust and faith saying, Lord, I know that you are good and you do good. I know that you have a plan of life for me. I'm going to stand in your trust. I'm going to stand in this place. And so he rebukes him yet again. And he says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. That's also from Deuteronomy chapter 6, where the Israelites failed in that manner. Are you picking up on the fact that we kind of fail a lot? Are you picking up on the fact that if we're like the Israelites, we fail yet again and again and again? And the only one who can overcome is what we're seeing in Jesus who overcomes the temptation of the enemy. That we can only go to Jesus who broke that power of the the enemy. So finally, we're in this third temptation. 
And I would say this, out of all three of these, this is the most profound temptation. This is probably the, most, the biggest challenge for Jesus and the, has, the, has the biggest readout no matter what he does. So he, the enemy says, you know, uh, it, w- it was probably most likely a vision where the enemy and Jesus were looking over the world. And the enemy says, I'll give you all of this. I'll give you all the nations with all all their splendor. Well, Jesus's mission was to regain the dominion of the world. So that's pretty tempting. But he says, the enemy says, well, but there's one, one caveat. If you, if, you just, if you just bow down and worship me, I'll give it to you. If you just break the first and the second commandment, I'll give it all to you. Then, then you, you have it. You, know, you don't have to die for it. You don't have to take the cross for it. You don't have to do any of it. That's a win-win. Come on. All you got to do, bow. Friends, in the first two temptations, Jesus responds, I feel like fairly, this is, Whatever, scripture, scripture, I'm done with you. I'm not, I'm not budging. But he doesn't, it doesn't feel like it gets heated, you know? What is, what is his response here? But it says right away, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. Away from me! Get away! Man. I don't know about you. He's trying to instill doubt the first two times, but now he's giving him this opportunity to get out of the cross. And Jesus is like, no. That would do so much more harm than good. For if he was to take this, he would automatically sin. That's sin. I shall have no other God before me. I will not bow and worship another God. Sin. Jesus had to be the pure and spotless lamb. Remember, he's starving. Remember, this is the weakest moment. And by this time, the third temptation, oh, but he says, get away! This would have changed the plan of salvation. This was when Satan clearly crossed the line And Jesus responds, get away from me. And then he says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Again, going to Deuteronomy. If you're not convinced that the Old Testament is important, this should convince you of that, that Jesus again and again and again and again goes back to the Old Testament. I mean, it's kind of an easy way out for Jesus. I think we all like the easy way out. I think our flesh would prefer not dying on a cross. Anybody with me? But Jesus knew that if he entertained that and he bowed and worshiped, he would be in sin. He would no longer be the pure and spotless lamb. He would not be the perfect one to be sacrificed to remove all sin. That's pretty powerful. What I would like to do is kind of put it on us and remind us what sin does to those around us. That when we entertain sin, that it has a massive impact on everybody around me. My sin is not just internal. It's not just my own little thing that I deal with. It is. It's going to have ramifications some way, shape, or form. And Jesus saw this and said, what, get away. Like, I, no, like immediately. You guys, we've got to have some strong reactions every once in a while. No! That's why we need Jesus to help us through temptation. That's why we need the body of Christ to come alongside and say, hey, dude, I, I need you right now. Hey, I need you to pray right now. Can you, I'm, I'm facing this. I'm hurting. I want to just, like, help me. Or, help me. Come on, you can call. Shoot, if you have a good enough friend, you should be able to go to their house. 
We, we need that with one another in the body of Christ, that we would bear one another's burdens together, that we would not be lonely rangers, that we wouldn't just be isolated, that we would be together in all of this. Our sin has massive impact, and, and man, this would have generational impact, and I know that if I entertain some sins, oh my goodness, it would, it would last generations to come. And we've got to have an awareness that sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death. Like, we should fear God and fear sin a lot. But friends, I think we have a problem where we don't fear sin anymore. Where, where oh, whatever, Jesus has got it covered. But it will ruin your life and those around you. So, so let's have an awareness that the enemy is coming after you in your weakness, in the most uh, temptation type of ways. He's coming after you and he wants to take your knees out. And he will do it with a smile on his face. We're going to have the worship team come on, come on up. We're going to close in worship. So Jesus just gets heated, right? And he goes, away, away from me, Satan. And it, obviously there's that passage in James where it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But before that, James says these words. He says, he says submit yourselves to God. First, everybody say Submit. We love that word, don't we? We're like, oh, that's a word that I just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> no, we, we have a hard time with that. You know why? Because we have a lot of pride. Submission has everything to do with humility. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit to God. And, and then I will be able to resist the devil. And, and then he will flee from me. And Jesus, you saw that from the baptism. He submitted himself to the plan of God and he went out to the desert. He was led by the, by the Holy Spirit in humility and he fasted for 40 days. And, and you see this incredible process that he went to and he had the strength and ability to say, get away from me. Some of us need to say, get away. Some of you need to go pray through your households and say, in Jesus' name, this house will serve and honor the Lord God Almighty. Some of you need to pray for your spouses when you get home and say, Jesus, would you bless my spouse, Lord? Help and heal our relationship right now, Lord. Have your way, not my way. Some of you need to rally your kids together and say, hey, kids, listen, we've, we've kind of been iffy on the whole church thing and we've been iffy on like following God, but man, hey, check it out. Dad was a little off. Here's the deal. I'm convicted. We're going to church together. We are on mission as a family together, seeking Jesus out together. Some of you need to rally and say, sin will not have a foothold in my life or in my family, period. Not going to happen. Can we take a stand? Let's go. Let's stand up. I didn't actually mean that literally, but then I should have done it literally. <laughs> Hey, this is, a, this is a chance to respond in, in worship. And I, I just feel the presence of the Lord wanting to just say, hey, this is a time to deal with your own life, your own heart. This is you and Jesus right now. It's not you and your spouse. It's not you and your kids. It's just you and Jesus. Jesus was tempted in every way. He didn't sin. He gives me the strength. He gives me the ability to do that too. So I lean in on him with one another. So let's worship in response.
thank you that you are trustworthy, God, that we can put our trust in you, Lord, because you have shown us over and over, God, how faithful you are. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would build our trust today. God, I know that we are not all able to fully put our trust in you sometimes, Lord, but that that would be our prayer today is that we could walk closer with you, God. God, because we know that you've experienced it all, God, that you are the one that can walk us through this life, Jesus. And so we put our trust in you today, God, and I pray that you would build that in us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to come forward for prayer, feel free to do that. But otherwise, have a great day, and we'll see you next week.